Good morning, Hope in Christ Church. How is everyone? Great. Awesome. Great to hear. Um, if you're visiting with us today, thanks for coming. It's great to have you with us. Um, if you'd like to know more about Hope in Christ, um, please pick up a visitor's packet that are uh, in the back in the lobby. Um, you can learn a little bit more about us and see any one of our elders to, um, you know, to, to get more information. We'd be happy to assist you with that. Um, and if you're, whether you're here or watching online, please let us know how we might be able to serve you um, and what we might be, what needs you might have. Um, one way to do that is if you're here, in the back of the chairs, there's a, a connect card. Um, you can use those to be added to our email list or our prayer chain. Um, you can drop those in the wooden offering boxes um, in the back or as you leave the church. Um, and with that, I'm going to pause for just a moment. It's, um, feels like it's been forever since we've been here. I mean, we came back last week, but our family has been, seems like, like two months in a row, like sick with COVID and, uh, you know, thinking about needs and just the way the church has helped us is we, you know, we're truly blessed by all of you with meals and cards and, um, picking things up and dropping things off. So. You know, our family, we can't say thank you enough for, for all the support that everyone has given us. So um, thank you for that. Um, the next um, announcement that I want to go through is giving. And I kind of want to share a little story about giving. It's, um, do you remember, I think I do have a story when I was a kid. And you get the smallest amount of money, whether it be from allowance or you find some. Um, and I remember going away to a camp one year. I, can't even remember how old I was, but I was so excited that I spent my money on a ring from my mother. And I think it was like 20 cents for one of those plastic rings, right? And I was so excited to give that to my mother when we got back. And she treated that ring like as if it was a real diamond, right? She just was filled with joy. And um, I think about 2 Corinthians 9-7, I'm going to paraphrase, but each of us should give as they feel led in the heart, not reluctantly, um, or because you feel forced to give, but out of love, for God loves a cheerful giver, right? Um, so I think as we, we give to the Lord each week, I just kind of have this picture, I was thinking as I was preparing for the announcements that um, when we give to the Lord this way, um, whatever that can be, he's up there and he's treasuring um, our gifts to him, and however they are. So, um, with that being said, we'll be not we're not passing around offering baskets, uh, but we have our boxes in the back uh, of the church, or as you leave, or in the sanctuary, or you can give online. Um, if you are visiting with us today, please do not feel obligated to give. The church is supported by its members and regular attendees, and we're just happy that you're here. Um, we do have some specific giving needs that I want to bring up is um, the undercover pantry is in need of some monetary donations. I know that um, the church family really gives um, generously when it comes to filling the pantry, but there's some monetary needs. So if you feel led to give um, in that area, you can just write a check and put UCP um, in the check. I'll be honest, we live in a world of acronyms. I thought I would have figured this out sooner. I'm like, what does UCP mean? <laughs> right? I'm like, well, how is UCP going to help this out? You know, but I figured it out. Um, yes, you all elected me as your treasurer. I'll just say <laughs> that. So, um, so, <laughs> and we are still looking for some um, additional funds for our keyboard. We're almost there. Um, we were about $470 short. Um, so again, thank you for giving um, to that need. Um, it is on the fritz and it's hanging in there. So it's, it's just waiting for the rest of it. So um, thank you for that. Some uh, youth group um, events coming up. There will be Saturday, July 16th from 2 to 8 p.m. There will be swimming, games, food and more at Pastor Steve and Cheryl's house. So please bring your swimsuit and a towel. I don't think Pastor Steve likes to share his swim trunks. So um, <laughs> you bring your own, that'd be great. <laughs> Um, youth group lock-in. So Friday, August 5th at 6.30 p.m. Um, to Saturday, August 6th at 9 a.m. Um, so the kids will be, youth group will be locked in for games and food, worship, and a message. Um, I've done 
several of these lock-ins over, over my lifetime. They were great fun. I can't handle them anymore, I'll be honest. You know, I used to be able to stay up all night and run with it. Uh, even though I'm a night owl, I crash. So uh, who's ever going to be here for that, thank you. So I don't have to do it. Um, and then um, we'll be hosting VBS again this year, the Wild West Wonders. That's going to be July 25th and 20 through the 28th from 60, 6 to 8 p.m. So you can sign up on our website. That's for kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, so I know that's been a lot of work. I don't know if we still need volunteers, but I'll put it out there because I'm sure we can always use more people. So if anyone's still willing to help out with VBS, um, please let Cheryl or is it Maddie that knows. So for that, um, foundational doctrines of the Christian faith are on Fridays at 6 p.m. at Pastor Steve and Cheryl's house. Um, if anyone's interested in baptism um, or baby dedication, please see Pastor Steve for that. Um, women's, or excuse me, um, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Bible study with Jeff and Carol Owen. Um, it's here in the sanctuary. And um, there is no child care, so just please be aware of that. And um, young adults group, ages 18 to 28, from 6.30 at 6.30 on Fridays at the Beelands, um, is still going on through the summer. And um, we are still in need of nursery help and kids, church teachers, and assistants. So please see Cheryl if you're willing to help out th with that. I'd really like to get her staffed up because I really don't want to have to come up here and be deceptive again, um, you know, to try and get people to, to, to raise their hands and say we love our kids. So um, if you're feeling led to, to serve there, please let Cheryl know. And um, again, if you're feeling led to serve anywhere, there's a help wanted list out in the back. Pick one of those up and see where there are some needs in the church. And even if you're thinking that maybe there's something is in there, but there's an area you feel like um, you know you want to serve, then please see one of the elders or Pastor Steve, and, and you know we'd like to get you plugged in. So, am I miss anything? All right, let's go to prayer. Father God, it is uh, truly a blessing to be um, part of your family. Um, I know we are blessed um, ourselves by it, and uh, the world is a mess, and it needs you now more than ever. Um, and as the world looks to drive and push you away, we need to run to you all the more. Um, it's you who gives us strength and courage and most of all hope. Um, all you ask of us is obedience, and yet we struggle uh, to do that, our own wills, our own desires. Um, takes us away from the work you have entrusted to us. So Lord, please help us uh, to put our selfish ways aside and uh, live our lives in service to you, um, doing the work that you have called each and every one of us to do so that we may glorify you and make you known. Please help us uh, clear our minds um, of all the outside distractions. Let you be our focus this morning so that we may hear you speak to our hearts. Please be with Pastor Steve uh, as he delivers his message and that his words might not be his own, but of you. Father God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them?
Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Amen. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time.
hold everything for us. God, I just ask this morning that you would turn our hearts more and more towards you. God, that you would cause us to chase after your son, that we would follow him in righteousness. God, that you would teach our hearts your law and would cause us to obey them. God, I lift up today. I ask that, that you would be glorified. God, I ask that we would be challenged by your word. And God, that you would lead us in everlasting righteousness through your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning. A couple of things I want to mention before we dismiss our little darlings off to their... Uh... It's so funny. <laughs> Uh, before we dismiss them off to the classes. Um, and that would be um, some things that I want to make sure that Sunday School uh, Kids Church teachers know. Um, I picked up a keyboard yesterday, an electric keyboard, um, for use in the other church. But it's heavy, and uh, it's in the back of my truck, and it's parked over by the old church. So if any of you younger gentlemen um, would like to take that out of the back of my truck and wheel it into someplace in the old church sanctuary near a receptacle so we can test it out. That would be awesome. Just uh, grab my truck keys and uh, let yourself into the old church. And when you're done uh, carting that thing in there, uh, just leave the truck keys on the floor and uh, I'll pick it up later. Um, the old, the um, new members, the new covenant members class that's happening here, if you're signed up for that or you're not signed up for it, but you want to come anyways, um, there'll be a little bit of a break after the service, 15, 20 minutes while we say our goodbyes and talk to people, but that class will be at the end of the hallway, last room on the right, unless we have too many people, then we'll maybe move it in here, that would be awesome. Um, and we have books for you and everything, so uh, there'll be a little bit of a break. So if you didn't bring your lunch, run out and grab one in between the two times and and that will work out just perfect. Um, and you don't have to be a member to take the class. You just learn more about us, what we do, why we do it. And uh, it's interesting. It's interesting stuff. So I think, oh, and the VBS, right? We are not only looking for people to help, but we're looking for, um, I didn't call it the right thing last week, right? Uh, really awesome but inexpensive prizes. You know, a couple of bucks. You know, bright and shiny things, things that make a lot of noise, something that a, a uh, kindergartner through fifth grader would really like. So uh, start making a pile of those. Where should they put those, Cheryl? Yeah, in the small room between the two Sunday school classes. Okay, so. Okay, one of those rooms down there on the right. There'll be a big bucket. On the left, okay, see, I get my rooms confused. Uh, we'll have to number those rooms someday. Unless they already are, and I didn't notice. But at this time, we can take our little darlings down to their classes, and the parents can escort them down there to get them signed in. And while they are doing that, the rest of us can get up and say hi to someone uh, that they don't know or haven't seen in a while or want to get to know better or however. We'll be back in the meat of the word in a minute.
Okay, well it looks like most of our kids are all signed into the places uh, where they need to be to learn more about God's Word. So we can get back into our seats, we can crack open these Bibles and see what uh, Paul's letter to the Colossian church has to say for us this week. I provided uh, an outline in your bulletin if that's uh, something that you want to work with and, and you're missing any of those three pieces, your Bible, the outline, and the uh, and a pen, they're all available uh, either by the back of the church or in the lobby. The, uh, sometimes it helps you follow along a little bit, maybe even keep you awake. I'm going to start off by apologizing up front for my difficulty with Greek names, because I could say them a hundred times and I'm telling you, no matter how much it makes sense out here, it just doesn't seem to want to come out in uh, a theologically correct manner, but you'll know what I'm talking about anyways. Um, so this week is the end of our, our uh, series of sermons in the book of Colossians, that small church Paul has never been to, but um, feels very, very, um, um, committed to their defense against false teachers and to their growth into a church. Um, next week, we're going to move on to six or seven sermons. Um, kind of grew out of last week's sermon. Not really tied to it directly, but but it, it, it's uh, it's something that I think will 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 springboard off of last week's sermon. So if you turn me, uh, turn in your Bibles to chapter four, verse seven in the book of Colossians. We'll get to work and finish this. Finish this book right up. And while you turn there, I'm going to remind you of a piece of classic literature um, that I think illustrates the main principle of this text quite well. It's a short story written by Damon Knight in 1950. I think I may have um, shared this illustration with you way back in 2019, but I'm not really sure. It was a, a story titled, by, titled uh, To Serve Man. And it uh, didn't really become widely known until 12 years later. It was used by Rod Sterling in one of his episodes of The Twilight Zone. And it goes something like this. Uh, Once upon a time, there lived a man named Michael Chalmers who desperately wanted to serve mankind. He wanted to bring peace into the world. And he did this by using his extraordinary God-given gift of cryptology or code breaking. And along with his assistant named Patty, they would work long hours trying to break the codes of enemy forces that wanted to disrupt the peace of the world. One day, while he was doing this, uh, alien spaceships started circling the globe. And inside these spaceships were aliens called Canamits. They were nine foot tall creatures and they landed and they addressed the United Nations and they offered the world friendship and promised to help mankind solve all their problems. Overpopulation, war, hunger, disease, all they desired was to be trusted. But after the representative of the Canamits left the UN building, the American ambassador noticed that the Canamit representative had left a book behind. But everything written in it was in the Canamit language. So they turned the book over to Mr. Chambers and an assistant Patty to decipher. And after months and months of work, they were able to figure out just the title. And it said, To Serve Man. And when the world leaders heard that this was the title, their fears were all relieved. So they did begin to trust the aliens, and as promised, the aliens' technology ended hunger and solved all the world's problems. And as a result of all of this great relationship going on, thousands and thousands of humans began shuttling over to the Canamit's home planet to see this paradise-like place. But meanwhile, Mr. Chambers had pretty much given up on his translating the contents of the book, and he made plans himself to visit that distant planet. But Patty, she continued to work day after day after day to try to translate this book. And finally, that day came when Mr. Chambers was to board that spaceship. Patty was able to decipher the context of the book and she rushed to the blast off zone, but she was separated from talking to him by this fence. As he was getting on the spaceship, she yelled to him, Chambers, Chambers, don't get on the ship to serve man. It's a cookbook. It was too late for Mr. Chambers to get away. He's ushered aboard the ship and lifted off. And that was the end of the story. 
Too late for Mr. Chalmers. He had tried so hard to serve the world at his own expense, using his God-given gifts. And this is exactly what these people in this church and Colossae is trying to do. This is what Paul's letter is trying to do, to encourage the Christians to serve the world at their own expense. But like Mr. Chalmers, the church is surrounded by a world that seeks to serve itself at the expense of others, like the Canamites. That's the dynamic in this, in this, uh, in this scripture here. Right? The church is being asked to serve in an entirely different way than the world likes to serve. And that's the principle that emerges from this text. The main theological principle that I think emerges is the church and those in Christ must all work together to serve him. Right? When we serve, it should be to serve Christ, not ourselves. And that's what we... That's what got all those people getting on this spaceship in trouble, right? They thought they were going to be served according to their own desires. But what they got was to be served with gravy and two sides. Right? That's what happens when we serve for our own comfort. We serve with our own desires in mind, right? We're supposed to be serving like Christ did, not to serve in a way that serves ourselves. So let's, let's read through this text and see the details that emerge. And again, I apologize for the, for the Greek. Tychius will tell you about all my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they are going to tell you everything that has taken place. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of uh, Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you. And for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis, Luke, my beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Give my greetings to the, all the brothers at Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is much more than a farewell. For, for six weeks, seven weeks, I didn't look it up, but we've been in here a little while. But Paul has been teaching a lot about Christianity and the church, about Christ and the church. And now in the farewell, what he's doing more than saying goodbye is he's modeling it. And that's the perspective. That's how we're going to dig into this text here today. It's much more than a goodbye. It, it's a teaching on what happens when you take all of those last five or six sermons that we talked about and apply them to your life, your personal life and the life of the, of the, uh, of the church. So, you know, the conclusion of this letter it includes personal notes about, about different personalities, the way they're gifted, the way uh, believers can serve. And we can support, support they, can, they can be, their calling can be supported, is what he's saying. You know, so support these people, he's saying. And the first thing that we see there in that regard, is that the church must cultivate new ministry workers. Right? The first three verses here introduces those two guys, right? Tychicus and Onesimus. Tychicus is mentioned in Acts 29 and in Romans 15. He's a ministry worker who accompanied Paul on his third missionary journey. He also traveled with him for Corinth to Jerusalem to deliver uh, a gift to the church. There he is described as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant. And that's how we serve Paul during um, his imprisonment, during his missionary journeys. Um, later, we see actually he grew to the extent to where he was sent as an interim pastor in, uh, 
think it was Ephesus and Crete, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that from memory. But he was filling in for, for Timothy and Titus while they were away. So he continued um, to grow in his responsibilities in the church. Um, Onesimus, right, he was a fugitive slave. We talked about him at the, at the picnic a little bit. He had run away from his owner, who was a member of the Colossian church, named Philemon. Right? He'd run to Rome to hide in that large population there. But instead of personal freedom, what he found was Paul, the church, and spiritual freedom in Christ. Funny how God works like that, right? By God's providential pen, he met Paul, received Christ as his Savior and his Lord, and began serving Christ. And the reference for that is Philemon 1.10. Um, these are the two characters that Paul has selected to deliver this letter and the, and the letter to Philemon uh, to Colossae. Um, both of these men had been discipled by Paul. At least one of them had been brought to Christ by Paul. And now they were being entrusted with this amazing ministry, right? Helping uh, bring God's word to the Colossian church. They grew from believers in ministry to real servants, right? At least in the, in the case of the, of the latter, right? He became that church leader. Right? These were men that Paul personally recruited because he was able to see and confirm the call that God had put on their lives, right? These people were called by God to enter into ministry and Paul was able to give them the opportunity to serve, to exercise the gifts that God had given them. Right? Like, like I'm, I'm thinking about the church doing this at, like, like uh, recruiters on a pro baseball team. Right? The, the recruiters, they, they, they pay recruiters a lot of money. Right? And do the recruiters go out and look for the best baseball players? No. No, everybody knows who the best baseball players are. You pick up the newspaper and figure that out. They're looking for younger guys that have undeveloped talent. They talk to them, they see where that talent is going, and if they believe that it is appropriate, they hire them, right? And you know, that illustration falls apart in the church a little bit because we're not hiring anybody, but that's what we need to look for. We need to look for people that God is calling, right? You can always look for people that God has already called, but that's easy. Right? What we really need to look for is people that have gifts that are undeveloped. That's what Paul did here with these two characters. Right? I think that's what I outlined, really, in, in uh, um, my pastoral report in the spring meeting. If you uh, haven't got a copy of that, if you weren't able to um, attend that meeting, there are... Um, copies of it in the library and I believe that Katie sent it to you in an email but it's important for you to know what's going to happen in the next in the next year or so but we're really um, going to concentrate our efforts on giving people opportunities to serve it all came begins the same way as it did with these two characters right before they were sent out to serve in ministry they were mentored Right, um, A.W. Tozer has a great quote to this matter uh, we're here to be worshipers first and workers second if we take a, a convert and immediately make a worker out of him, God never meant that to be so. God meant that a convert should learn to be a worshiper, and after that, he can be a worker. The work done by a worshiper will have eternity imprinted on it. We need to cultivate people for ministry, right? It cultivates to make the ground they habit fertile for their growth, right? Just like gardeners, or just like good gardeners, not like how I garden, right? How Rick gardens. For us to cultivate ministry workers in the church, we have to start with discipleship, right? Not just checking for a pulse. Before a person serves, they need to ask themselves and answer correctly the same questions that Colby Hammond asked last night in his um, exposition of Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Who do you say Jesus is? Right? If you truly believe that he's the Son of God, sent to save sinners, who was born from a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross voluntarily so that all who repent and believe are justified, pure, and acceptable by God. If you believe in that, Jesus, the one who rose again after three days conquering death, so by faith we can also receive new life and start over again, that Jesus, the Jesus that sits at the right hand of God right now interceding for us, that's who you believe and you can serve. 
If Jesus is anything else to you other than your Lord and Savior, you're not quite ready yet. It would be a huge mistake for you to serve in a place of ministry in the church. Not because you're no good, because God's still working on you. Step one is to worship. If that's your case, stay with us. Let us serve you until, you, until you're cultivated. When you're ready, when you're stable, when you're confident in your faith, then God calls you to ministry, service. Right? He gives you the gifts. He gives you the courage. He gives you the opportunity. Right? And we, we, as a church, right? Cultivating people like that, we can't jump in the middle of that. Right? That's playing God. Right? We don't call people to ministry. Our job in the church is to confirm what God is doing in people's lives, not to control it. Right? The leadership of the church may need to concern themselves with the biblical foundation for a ministry. Right? We don't need a fortune-telling tent out on the street. Leadership may need to be concerned themselves with a person's qualifications. Like when we um, conferred God's calling on the diaconate, the first things we do is look to Scripture, Acts 6 and 1 Timothy 3. The leadership may need to concern themselves with whether this ministry fits into the mission statement or direction of the church. Right? You're calling... Very well could draw you away from a church into another one that can support that ministry. We don't know. Right? That's what happened to me. You know, as I was preparing for ministry, I was called from a perfectly fine church. All my friends were there. Everybody got along. But no. God calls you a church. You know, it was further away. The average age was 80. There was zero children. You know, it had all this liturgy, right? And it was congregational, which I didn't know anything about. It was all, you know, I, I came from a Baptist background, a Bible, a, a, you know, Bible background. I didn't know anything about congregationalism, you know, elder-led, covenants, scary stuff. But it was all okay. God called me there. I didn't run away. And I've done that. It doesn't work. Take my word for it. <laughs> That's why when a person attends the New Covenant members class, after that class at some point, you know, Alf or another elder will follow up with them and ask them, hey, are you guys, are you, are you, are you planning on pursuing membership? Are you planning on becoming a covenant member? And if they say yes, We'll ask if they have any comments or questions or concerns and ask them how they plan on serving here. Because that's what we do in a covenant relationship with each other. Right? That's how you grow. That's how you become more Christ-like. That's how you discover your place in the kingdom. It's how you surrender to God. It's how you do the work that he prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Right? Last week I used the phrase, going into the redemption business with God. Kind of fun way to look at it. One thing I've learned is that when you surrender to God in this way, most people are kind of surprised about what he calls them to. And I was called to, to teach five-year-olds for three years. Then I was called to preach to a, a chapel services in K through eight graders for two years. Then I was called to, to teach an adult, adult Bible school uh, study for two years. And each time God called me, I thought that was that. And I didn't realize that it was adding up. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to lead to him calling me as a pastor. We gotta to surrender to God in the way that we serve. Now, all Christians are called to serve in the church in some fashion. All churches are called to cultivate these ministry workers. And none of us are exempt from this principle. We can expect some downtime. Right? We need time to rest. We may need time to educate ourselves. We may need time to, to wait for God to open up some possibilities or deal with difficult circum circumstances in our life. That's all part of it. It's not a race. I've mentioned this before. I, I, I know wonderful saints in the church that because of physical limitations, um, their act of serving is diligent prayer. 
And I also know people in the church that have sold everything they own to move to Tanzania. And we're going to fall somewhere in between those two places. But those two places that I, I mean, those my, the peace, people I know personally that are my, my boundaries for speaking on this subject. Uh, every place within that boundary is where God's calling you. There isn't, it's not a scale of, of, of bad, you know, bad to better. It's a scale of submission, and, and, the, and the person that's, that's diligently praying and the person that's celebrating the Tanz Tanzania are, are serving equally in the kingdom because they're serving the way God has called them to. You know, check out that, that help wanted list if, if you're looking for some ideas. I just printed some more of them. It's not for me. It's not so we can get big and fancy. God does that if he chooses. Right? Do it to serve Jesus. Do it to preserve and protect his bride. Do it to grow and discover where he wants you. And what he wants you, where he wants you. Do it as a do it to see what happens. Good grief, what an adventure. I'm telling you. What's the worst that can happen? Right? I got thrown out of nursery. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm not allowed to pick out the movies for family movie night anymore. <laughs> they still let me watch them, though. <laughs> My vision for a standalone TLC worship service kind of crumbled a bit, but they still love me there. There's like 15 kids signed up for my theology class that Steve Jackson and I are teaching. But don't be afraid. If something you try doesn't work out, you just pick yourself up and dust yourself off and give it another shot. It's no big deal. And I want you to know that the leadership of the church is committed to you and your ability to serve Christ. So just let us help you. Go to prayer. Ask God to reveal your gifts to you in a place where you might exercise them and see what happens. Again, a couple of reminders. Right? A couple of things that could derail you from this. Unconfessed sin in your life. Sinful lifestyle that you're immersed in. Selfish desires for serving. And misunderstanding your gifts. You know? So if, if you're in a circular pattern here and, and, and things don't seem to be going right, search yourself for that stuff and come talk to me and, and, and we'll try and work through it. Should be really exciting to live as a Christian. And the more drawn away from God's society is outside the walls of these churches, the more exciting it is for us to do it. If you're definition of exciting is the same of mine. If it's laying on the couch, you're going to be disappointed. If it's getting out in the world and impacting people for Christ. It's, that's what I'm talking about. And when you do this, you shouldn't be alone. And that's our second point. Right? The church must support existing ministry workers. We see this in verses 10 through 14. Right? Paul mentioned five others. He calls them his ministry co-workers. Aristarchus, huh? Mark, Justice, Epaphras, Luke. Again, I searched through different parts of Scripture to figure out what these guys were up to. Why are all these guys in the same group, right? Aristarchus, described as Paul's traveling companion in Acts 19, had the honor of being seized by an angry mob with Paul. Faithful companion, also a company of apostles on, on quite a few journeys, Acts 20 and 27. Um, we'll get you a little bit of a, um, a reference for, uh, for what he did. Mark, you know, is the author of the Gospel of Mark, sometimes known as John Mark. He was a co-worker of Paul during his missionary journeys and his imprisonments. Near the end of Paul's life, Paul sends a request to Timothy from the prison. says, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. All right, the third guy here, Justice, a fellow worker, and a comfort to Paul. We got nothing on him. All right, this is the only reference to him in the scripture. The force is Epaphras, right? We know from earlier in my sermon series, he's the founder of this church in Colossae, uh, Colossae the one who brought, and he's also the one who brought the news of its condition to Paul. So everything Paul had written in this letter is in response to Paul trusting the actual words of Epaphras to him. So obviously, you know, he's a very trusted co-worker. 
according to uh, Philemon 123, uh, Epaphras had also been imprisoned with him as well for what we don't know. And the final guy here is Luke, right? The author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And we know that he was a physician and a Gentile. Um, Luke accompanied Paul off and on on his evangelistic excursions. One time he was left in Philippi and then he returned for the third, third missionary journey. He was left in Philippi to teach, right? And he was with Paul during his final imprisonment too. These five guys were mature believers who could be trusted to carry out the work of the church without supervision. Paul gave him a job and let him do it. Right? They didn't need Paul breathing down their neck to get their work done. That would have made them less effective because they'd been called by God. They'd been gifted by God. Right? Paul would have just gotten in the way. Right? They're mature believers, gifted ministry leaders that Paul supported. Right? Sometimes that not, that's not easy to do. For somebody like Paul, probably wasn't easy to let go sometimes. Um, I shared a little bit about this last night um, when we met, and I give that a plug too. Um, you know, last night we had a, a, a different kind of worship service at the old church, Saturday nights now. Um, it's going to be every two weeks. So I guess you could say it went well last night. We plan on doing it once a month, but it went well, so we'll do it every couple of weeks. And it was very encouraging, and it's not a replacement for this um, church service. It is different than this church service. It's kind of like bow hunting and rifle hunting. You know, um, you, you can't compare them. They're different. You just got to do both, you know. Um, well, kind of. But anyways. Um, but me letting go... Is, is I know that like seven years ago, God placed this image in my mind of me, to be in, me being able to have an evangelistic based, casual um, church service on a Saturday night that had a much younger feel to it. Um, and it was easy to do because I still picture myself as like 20, right, in here. Um, but it wasn't time for that. It wasn't a place for that here. And it, so I, I never really presented. I shared that idea with a number of people over the years. Just because I share things. Um, but, uh, and then out of the blue, um, you know, Jeff and, and Colby came to me with this idea um, well, a few months ago or something like that. And, and this whole thing came to fruition and I didn't lift a finger. I didn't even give him a key to the church. I mean, I, you know, I showed up and worshiped. It was awesome. Um, that's what Paul was doing with these characters. This is what we need to do for mature believers in the church, you know? about letting Christians develop and run ministries with trust and support of the church. You know, if you're continual in people's business when they're serving, right, they're going to get discouraged. They're going to be more, more worried about what you think than what Christ wants. And that's not what we want to do. We want to let these people exercise their gifts. We've got some great, great standalone ministries here at Hope in Christ Church. Like I said at the, at the Spring Pastors meeting, we've come a long, long way in, in three years, and you all, this this um, you know this sermon is part of an exposition series, and um, it's by no means of these words that I'm speaking today an admonition of of uh, of what you do here because you guys serve like no church I've ever seen, you know you can go down the role of the church, and and you know everybody's doing something pretty much. Um, but we need to keep doing it. We need to support the leaders that are already in place. Right? A, great, a great example of this is our ministry leader meetings. We had one a month or so ago. We're going to have another one on August 8th. Everybody's welcome. It might be pizza, right? If that's what it takes. I'm not above that. We share ideas. We make fun of each other. We see how ministries can help each other. It's really awesome, right? Ministry work isn't supposed to be easy. That's why we have each other. Right? The church, what, what we're doing in this church is what's been going on for 2,000 years. Okay? Every minute of those years, ministry workers have needed support emotionally, physically, spiritually. Right? And if you're in a ministry here, and, and, and especially if you're leading one, if you're feeling burned out, don't keep that to yourself. Let us help you. It's not the end of the world. We'll make a plan. We'll lighten your load. We'll come up, give you some help, maybe even let you take a break. Um, sometimes when you're working in ministry, these ministries can... They can take on a life of their own, and you end up serving the ministry instead of Christ. Right? That's not what you want. That's the danger. 
That's not just in the local church, it's in all churches, which is the final point here. The church must encourage all ministry workers. Right in these verses 15 through 18, Paul mentions the Christians at Laodicea to a person named Nympha and the church in her house and a guy named Archippus. Laodicea is like nine miles from Colossae and it was growing, it was wealthy, right? Much the opposite of Colossae, which was getting a little poorer and a little more broken down every day. Um, looking forward 30 years, it didn't really go well. For Laodicea, it would receive one of the seven letters in the book of Revelation, which Jesus pretty well was disgusted with the condition of the church. Spit you out of my mouth because you're like lukewarm that church. Right? And the person named Nympho is probably a wealthy woman with a large home enough to accommodate the church like Lydia did in Macedonia. Archippus was a young man from Colossae, I'm speculating a little bit here, stitching different verses together. The son of Philemon. He moved to Laodicea, possibly to serve pastoring the church there at the home of Nympha. Right? So these are the folks that had little, little or no personal connection with Paul, but he really felt called to encourage him. Now, encouragement is such a vital part of the ministry. You know, I was talking to a, a, a social worker yesterday, and... Um, you know, she was talking about her work and everything like that, and I was distinguishing my work uh, from her work a little bit by saying that a lot of the work that I do and elders do and, and ministry leaders do uh, needs to be done with complete confidence because we don't work towards being able to see the results. Um, and it's a little bit different with a, a goal-based job where you, 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 know, you set, the, set a site and you work towards that goal. Um, we're working from a teaching, from God's uh, um, perfect word and, and going forward with that no matter what. We might not see the results ever. I mean, I shared with you the last couple of weeks how you know, some of the work Shirley and I had done five, six, seven years ago is starting to blossom now. And we haven't heard anything in six years. And all of a sudden, these people are popping up. Very encouraging, very, very encouraging, but it leaves you six years where you could use some encouraging, right? <laughs> Ministry can be hard because people are funny. <laughs> it, it's just how it is, you know? Um, from a personal perspective, um, this is probably half. I cleaned off my top shelf. Um, this is probably half of the cards and encouragement I've gotten for you guys. Three years. Very encouraging. The other half are used in bookmarks. And I'll, uh, I'll pull those out. Maybe I'll wallpaper the place someday with it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's very, very encouraging. Um, it works. You want some of that encouragement? Uh, let me do it. I, I got one for me, uh, just uh, for you guys. Dear Hope in Christ Church, on behalf of the board of the Four Seas, I am writing to express my thanks for your continual faithful giving and support of the Lord's work through the Four Seas. Did you realize that giving to the Four Seas increased by over 20% last year? The increase allowed us to resource our churches in ways we have not been able to in the past. Because of gifts such as yours, our ministries through the church development, uh, church multiplication and our conference care, among others, are flourishing. Thank you again for playing such a vital role in this work. Yours in love and grace of Jesus Christ, the Board of Directors for C's Denomination. To you guys. Um, we can have that same effect on other people if we pay attention. Right? That's what, that's what Paul is modeling here. We are, believe it or not, a healthy, growing church. There's plenty of churches around that are not. We can have a role in what God wants to do in those churches. We, you see in our, our, our weekly uh, prayer list, we do list a church there. 
um, usually every week, um, but we can do more. You know, God may place another church on our hearts where we can really come alongside and provide, I don't know, a worship team, um, is the pulpit, a pulpit supply, or whatever. We don't know. But you can certainly read in the book of Acts and, and in all the epistles how the other churches depended on each other. So that's something we need to stay alert for, you know? That's why we have churches full of people in Christ, right? So we can look out for this kind of stuff. Part of how each one of us serves Christ has to be in one of these sections. And we all have good days. We all have bad days in ministry. We all have seasons where our work is exciting and, and productive and other seasons where it seems to be we're just rowing upstream, expending a lot of energy and not getting any place. That's the real challenge that these verses put in our life. You know, are, are you like Onesimus or Tychicus? Are you looking for a place to serve, but you're not quite sure where? Let us know how God is calling you to serve and be prepared for it to look maybe a little bit different than you had imagined. Right? And, and for all of us, all the rest of us, are we looking out for these people? Are we trying to identify the people around us that may be in that position? Are you an Aristarchus? Mark, Justice, Epaphras, or Luke. Let us know how we can support you. You don't need to carry an entire ministry on your back. Right? And as we, as, uh, as we, are we as a church looking around at these existing ministries and seeing how we can support them? And as a church, all of us, are we looking around for others in churches like the one in Laodicea and like the servants, Nympha and Archippus, who needed encouragement? Because people need to hear that. And if you want to serve, but you're not sure how, come talk to me. Come talk to an elder. And take a look at that list and see what might fit. They're on the welcome table there. And, uh, oh, Mike's not here this week. Um, somebody out there will show you uh, where it is. Um, but if you do, you need to take serious time in prayer trying to discover what God might be calling you to and what your gifts are. And when you come to talk to me about it, don't tell me what you like. Don't tell me what you desire. And don't even tell me where you want to do it. Because I don't care. I really don't. I'll give one cotton pick and bit what you like and what you desire and where you want to do it. I want to hear what you feel God is sincerely telling you to do. We all have desires. We all have wants. That's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for God's call on your life and where he's calling you. It's not up to you. and It's not up to me. We just confirm it. That's how we need to look at this. That's what Paul is modeling here. And those are the challenges these verses put on our lives. But don't be a can of it. Let's close in prayer. Show us, Father, how you've gifted us. Help us to serve you. Give us the boldness and the opportunity to use it for your glory. As a church, give us the ears to hear and the eyes to see who and how this occurs. Cleanse us of our pride and our envy and our resentment that seems to go along with this issue. Grant us the humility needed to serve you honorably. Strip us of the sins that keep us at a distance and unable to serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue on with the corporate praise and prayer, but we're going to do it um, online this week because we have another uh, special event following the praise and prayer. So watch yourself. We normally don't, uh, we normally don't uh, have to put that on the, uh, the internet, but let me get my praise and prayer list. 
And if you would like to get that list, as Derek mentioned, um, fill out that Connect card in the seat ahead of you and uh, give it to Katie or, or, or send it in and we'll, uh, we'll get you right on that list. So the first thing we would like to do is ask you for praises and how God has worked in your life this week. Do I have any volunteers to uh, share with us a little bit about what God's been doing in their life? Obviously, uh, last night's praise, uh, last night's worship service is definitely on there. Yes, Harmony. Um, I actually have a, both a praise and a prayer. Let them um, rip. <laughs> um, for, um, on, on Friday, I think it was Friday, um, we, we had the, well, I had the opportunity to see my mom, um, <laughs> give her her Christmas present seven months later. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I haven't seen her since COVID started. And it was really nice to be able to see her. Amen. Um, and she's still healthy? Yeah, she's doing good. Amen. Um, she said she feels great. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Um, and the prayer for her is for her to try um, get into the faith of not what she's in. She's not, um, for her to find Jesus. Um, because she, she's not... Um, I think she's a believer, but she's not, you know. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, her, Absolutely. Her faith is kind of broken. So okay. well. just ask for a prayer for her. her Amen. Name De- her name is Denise, if you don't remember her. Denise. Thank you very much. We will be praying for Denise. Any other praises? Yes, Carol. Just your message made me think back 20 years ago when I was teaching in junior church and this little boy named Colby. He said to me. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And the Hammond family has been in my life and been such a blessing. I don't know, maybe the kids were four or more. I don't know. Anyway, you we've just, watched them. We've been friends with them grow and mature, and we've all served together in different ways. And we've watched Caitlin and Colby and then Victoria and their whole family. And the love they have for the Lord and the <coughs> desire to grow and learn and be called. Amen. And so Amen. last night was just amazing for me to see this happening before my eyes. You just can't shake them, huh? You just... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, what an encouragement, you know, 20 years ago to be in a, in a children's church class and teaching somebody that just preached last night a church service and did a great job, I might add. So thank you, Colby. Amen. <laughs> That's great. That's, that's certainly um, an illustration for my sermon. Could have used that yesterday, you know. <laughs> yes? Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for their prayers. There's been lots of encouragement. Um, we have two, two sick family members, and we've seen some good days this, this last past week, and I'm very thankful for that and very encouraged. Uh, but you're very welcome. It's our pleasure to pray. And... Uh, I know people don't take these uh, these lists; um, they take them very seriously. So, um, you know, we we keep them close to our heart, and we pray for whoever we can. Are there any more praises here today? Okay, how about prayer requests? Anybody like to offer up a a prayer request? And we have a, a a number of categories here. Um, on our on our list here, many for um, for physical healing, healing, a number of uh, spiritual issues, and uh, again some encouragement and and different things. I think that uh, the ones on my heart today are, are uh, you know some of the churches that are struggling and some of the folks that are struggling themselves with addiction. And uh, both of those things are, are close and dear to my heart and usually make my list every day. So uh, with that. Um, yeah, we're getting the kids already. Yes, please, if you would do that. Oh, let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you for this time in which we gather together as a family of faith uh, to worship you and to come before you um, with petitions and thank you and worship. We just pray that we do it in an honorable way. Um, we have a number of children coming uh, that come every week and a number that are coming also for our Vacation Bible School, Lord. And we just pray that you would open their hearts to hear the gospel as it's presented. 
Just pray that as a church, we will continue to impact the community around us to help, help people to see the, the hope and the new life that's available and faith in your son. Lord, just pray for the, the addicted. Um, just pray for the uh, most vulnerable in society, Lord. Um, they need your help, and uh, we just pray that somehow we can help them. Each single person that comes to our undercover pantry, Lord, we just pray that with that they would receive um, a sample, of, of a, a very small sample, an insignificant sample, but the best we can do to imitate the love you have for all people. Lord, we look forward to the different adventures that you have planned for us and just pray that you give us the boldness and the opportunity to see this through. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, we have another special event, and it is a, a baby dedication. Heidi Marquis, so I would like to invite the, uh, the Marquis family to come forward. Still missing one. Mm -hmm. Hi, Heidi. This is <laughs> Heidi Marquis. And her dedication. <laughs> So Steve and Ashley Marquis have come before the church today, acknowledging and professing their dependence upon the Lord to raise their child, Heidi Lynette Marquis. Also in attendance here today are Ashley's parents, Milton and Maria. So we have a number of questions in the, in the uh, congregational tradition here to the parents. Do you come professing Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your lives? Yes. Do you come to dedicate yourselves to the biblical instruction, discipline, and love of this child? Yes. Do you come to dedicate Heidi, Lynette Marquis, into the ultimate control and will of God through Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. To all of you, do you, Hope in Christ Church, agree to support these parents by your example and through acts of service? And do you agree to reinforce the biblical instruction, discipline, and love this child under the supreme rule of Lord Jesus Christ? Answer by saying, I do. I do. Amen. When God had taken the ultimate personal control of leading his people in the, before, until the way of faith was established through Jesus Christ, he gave these commands in Deuteronomy 6. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you here today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, and when you are on the road, and when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of, doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when God himself has given us directions on how to raise a child, this is what he said. Let's pray together. Father, we bring this child to you with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might. We want to raise this child to love you and to serve you. Please help us to be the parents in the congregation that will set the right example for her and that this child might love and serve you throughout her life. It is to you that we dedicate this child, Lord. We ask for your protection, your guidance, your patience, and your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We also have long overdue uh, membership certificates for you. They've been sitting up here week after week and I've just for been forgetting to
to give them to you. I'm sorry about that. That's fine. There you go. Thanks, sir. And at this time, we would like to welcome the worship team back up front to um, close out our service with more wonderful worship songs.
plus be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for me. God bless you all and have a great week.